So hi guys, hi guys, welcome back to another edition of the Musings with the Moon Man with me, Stephen Fabric. Uh, like I said in the previous couple, uh, slightly different, looking at people who are coaches, managers, leaders in all different kinds of environment. We're going to predominantly look at sport at the moment, uh, football, because you know it's something that I know a little bit about. But you know, let's get one thing clear: everything that we speak about here can be applied to education, can be applied to to business, to CEOs of big companies to you as a family member with your loved ones, uh, you with your friends, you know, just normal work, anything. These principles that we speak about regarding football are principles for life, so they can be taken in any walk. Today, I have probably the, the most intriguing guest I've had so far, okay? And I, what I mean by that is, this is a student that I, I happen to, to teach, if you want to loosely call teach, okay? That I've had, uh, I've had the honour for the last two years to see not only develop and grow academically, but also as a person, uh, as well as as well as a coach. And I honestly believe that in five, ten years' time, this uh, this podcast will be something that you go back to, not for the fact of you know you're hearing great information, but because this guy is going to be one of the elite coaches in the country uh by far because this guy's got a, a football brain that is far superior to people that i know uh and it, I, I'm, I'm honored to have him, on, have him on this podcast because you know i wanna i've been kicking his butt for the last two years to to be the person that he wants to be so this would be an opportunity where he can he can speak his mind so it's an honor and a pleasure to have jimmy punter here on this podcast hi jim how are you hi boss you all right yeah i'm good mate how are you keeping Climbing the walls at the minute, if I'm honest with you. I've got to that point. I've got to that point. Obviously, guys, this is, we are in, you know, we're recording this when it's in quarantine. We're all sitting down uh, indoors trying to find ways to, uh, uh, to, to redevelop ourselves. I think that's the thing. I think everyone's trying to, trying to come up with a new person, you know. I'm trying to come up with a new Stephen Braybrook, you know, because the, the, the old ones are, you know, we don't want to be a Stephen Braybrook, so we're all trying to reinvent ourselves. So, before we carry on, Jim. Uh, just explain to the to the listeners, uh, you know, who are you? Who, who is Jimmy Panza? Uh, well, um, twenty three years of age. Obviously, I'm a. Stephen is my lecturer at the foundation degree at Chai University, where uh, I study sports science. Um, I've been I've been coaching since I was about sixteen. Really, I was I was playing sort of non league football at, at Worthing for the youth teams. And then, you know, I sort of moved into coaching when I was about 16. And from, I've just been coaching from there on, really. So, what, that's seven years now. Um, started off kind of, I think it was Worthing United under-15s at the time. Under-14s or 15s. Just dropping in, helping a friend do a couple of coaching sessions. And I think that's really where I kind of, kind of got the bug for it. Um, at that time, obviously, I'd gone to, to Worthing College, uh, where I studied there for three years. Nothing to do with sport. Wanted to go into finance uh, for some silly reason. Um, after I finished studying and playing for the college, uh, I basically decided to, to take on the role of, of one of the coaches there, which I'd done for free. So I'd done it on a voluntary basis for a year. Um, obviously, we know Dave Hall is on one of your earlier podcasts, Stephen. Um, he was a big facilitator in that. Um, so I've been doing that job now for four years. Um, doing that job for four years. And then at the beginning of last season, um, I, funny enough, I actually reached out to another one of your guests, uh, John Meany, um, just looking for a bit of advice about I wanted to go in and try and, and shadow a club at, at Ryman level just so I could go in, look at their, their processes, look at how they coach and obviously look at, look at the standard really. Um, obviously I'd been in, I'd been in that environment in a change room as a player, but I'd never obviously experienced that sort of intensity as, as a coach or part of a coaching staff. Um, and he straight away come back to me and said, look, um, we're looking for someone like that at Horsham Football Club. Uh, we're looking for someone to come and really help out. You know, you can come and shadow my sessions whilst he was there. And yeah, it's gone from there really. I've I kind of started at Horsham as just uh, you know, I pick up stuff at the end of a session. I pick up the bibs and the cones and help help, you know, move mannequins around. 
um, to this point, really being one of the you know first team coaches. So taking the work I've been doing a lot of recently is is you know our sort of tactical preparation. So the Thursday, you know, half an hour, forty five minutes on a Thursday is sort of mine to go through a bit of tactical preparation for for the Saturday games, really. So that's where that's where I'm at at the moment in terms of what I'm up to. And for someone so, you know, so young, you know, someone who's 46, 23 years, very, very young. Uh, but for someone who's so young, you know, you've, you've actually you've had a bit of success so far, you know. So college football, sort of, you know, talk about some of the success sessions you've had. If you can, uh, I'm miss, but... Yeah, no, I, I have, yeah. I've, you know, I've won, I've won, a, I won County Cup at college level um, as a player. Uh, then I've since then, you know, we've been we've been lucky enough and, and fortunate enough to, uh, to 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 keep competing at that level. Um, so we've gone on to win another five county cups. Yeah, five county cups since I've been at the college it, over two teams, um, which is obviously which is a mark of of, of where we've been at at the college sort of level in the Sussex area. Um, and then, you know, my first season of joining Horsham, um, we we managed to get promoted from from the Ryman South through the playoffs, um, which obviously is a fantastic experience. It's something that I will, you know, I'll remember as one of those great experiences I've had as a coach. Um, we we won the playoff final in in extra time from a dead ball. Um, and Steve, you know how much I love set pieces, so... Uh, that 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 definitely brought a smile to my face. Cool. So let's let's start asking some 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 insightful questions, and mate. So every single person who likes football, whether you're an armchair fan, whether you drink it in the pub with your mates, whether you're you know managing the high elite Premiership clubs, everyone has an opinion of the game. Okay, and everyone has a philosophy of the game. Okay, and. It, you know, one person's philosophy, someone else's personal philosophy, they get together and it ends up being, you know, a wall. Okay. So we'll have philosophies. What is Jimmy Punter's philosophy of football? The, this is an interesting question because for me, at the stage I'm at, I don't know yet. If I'm, if I'm being totally honest with you and the, and, and the listeners and, and myself, I don't know what my own philosophy is. But what I do know is that the more experiences that I have, the more my own identity as a coach is defined, 100%. So a lot of the experiences that I've had where I look at something and go, yeah, do you know what? I really like that. That I want, I, if I had a team, that's what I'd do. If, my, if this team was my team and I had sole control over it, that's what I'd do. There's also lots of experiences where I look at things and go, that would never happen. If I, if, if I was a manager, if I was a coach, or if I led this team, that wouldn't happen. So I think for me at the moment, I am still piecing together what I want football to look like in terms of a, a, a Jimmy Punter side. So it's, it's an interesting question because until I've gained that enough experience to be completely clinical in what I want, so no grey areas, I know exactly what I want in each situation, each moment, I wouldn't say I have a philosophy, but what I do have, like I have said, is I've got experiences. So, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's so many different ways to play football. Me and you have quite different, uh, you know, thought processes around around football. I'm furious. Um, furious all day long. So sometimes we agree on them. Sometimes we don't. That's why we have these, you know, forty-five minute discussions after lectures. But I think philosophy is, is a word that is banded around quite a bit and I think really if you can nail down a philosophy into five key principles I think that's I think that's would that would help you more so I was very very lucky um a couple of days ago to be on a FaceTime call with Chris Coleman the the ex Wales manager and that's pretty much you know what he reinforced to me is you have to wait until you have your set principles in stone and that's it. They're your principles. And, you know, you can either, you can either be punched in the face whilst you're throwing punches 
or you can be kicked in your ass whilst you're crawling away from a fight. And that's, you know, if you're going to stick to your principles or you're going to come away from your principles and then still lose. So I think for me, I wouldn't say, again, I wouldn't say I have a defined philosophy, but I'm now starting to develop, you know, those five, six sort of principles that I want to see in my football teams. And I think that, that, that's really important. Hey, it's like I say, you know, I think one of the things that I, I, I love about what you do and how you do it is, you know, it's always chasing the question. You know, the answers are not, you know, put in stone. You always have the ability and you do have the ability to, to question what answers are given. Uh, oh, 100%. Perfect what you believe about that. Here's a question I'm going to ask everybody. I've asked uh, previous guests, Dave Hall and, and Amosine, I'm going to continue asking this. What would you rather do? Would you rather win 1-0 with an 89th minute set piece <clears throat> and get booed off the park or lose 4-0 and play pretty football and get a few claps along the way? Win 1-0, 100%. Cool. And there's no, absolutely no why? doubt about it. Reason why? <clears throat> because football's about winning. No. That's what, I know, and this is, that, <laughs> this is what motivates, motivates me, Steve, and I think you, you know that as well. Um, the, one of the reasons I am a coach is because I do love winning. 100%. 100% something that motiva motivates me. And that's probably why I haven't worked in, in the youth development phase so far um, as part of my sort of coaching journey, as you will. Um, you know, I haven't really worked at, at, in, a, in a properly in, 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 in the youth development phase because really the, the coaching that I like to do at the moment is coaching teams on how to win. It's, it's, it, it, it's as simple as that. And, and winning 1-0, one -nil, winning 1-0 from a set piece in the 89th minute, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Football's a results-driven business. So here, here's a question. How, how, how do you think people or, or players or coaches, and we, could, we can take an analogy of, You've been involved with academy football for four years. You played it previously before that, coaching for two or three years now. So you've probably had, a, what, four years, five years then between playing mm. and, and, and this side of coaching. And Yeah. You know, so you've seen a lot of, lot of players come through. You've been one of them. Yeah. You've seen a lot of great players come through, a lot of great players that are playing good standard of football now. Uh, and you've seen players that were great at a time but no longer kicking footballs. How much is that word winning encouraged in, in coaches to players or managers to teams? Again, I think if we're talking about, you know, sort of professional development phase, so, you know, you're talking about your, your, your under 18s, your under 23s, you've, you're then going into your first teams. I think winning is crucial in terms of, the best player, the best players that I've seen come through the college system have an innate ability to drag teams through situations to win. And that comes from, you know, grit, determination. Um, yeah, they're technically efficient. Don't get me wrong. Technically efficient footballers. But when things are going wrong, they don't, they don't accept that. And they don't accept that of themselves and they don't accept that of their, of, of their fellow players. And I don't think it should be accepted in terms of if you are a participation sort of organisation, yeah, fair enough. If you are a performance-based organisation, at the college we are, we are performance-based. So obviously our aim is to, to develop young footballers to be able to be ready to go and play men's football. And to be ready to go and play men's football at any level, you have to have that innate ability to go and win. I, I firmly believe. Um, so I think winning is crucial, but it has to be, a, you know, I don't think, I think development, you know, you have to knock home development in, until, you know, you're under 15s, under 16s. As we start creeping into under 18s, under 23s, boys want to win. You know, teenagers want to win. 
I haven't really met that many teenagers who have come through the college or who I've played with personally who don't want to win. So I think saying that players should be coached how to win is important because I don't really see many players who don't want to win, but they just don't know how to. So that's an important phase of, of, of especially how we coach our players, especially in terms of our attitude going into games, our attitude in terms of how we deal and how we react with situations within the game, both adverse and, 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 and positive, um, and, and how we conduct ourselves when we are winning. So stuff like game management, I think that becomes really important when you, when you, you, know, when you start looking at that level. Um, and yeah, the overall, you know, how, especially mentally, we can affect our performance and we can affect the opposition performance. So I think for me, at, you know, at the under-18s, under-23s, first team level, they've got to be taught how to win. No, like, okay. No, I think, you know, from, from our experience, I think one of the things that, you know, and I think, I think, I think it took you a bit of time as well, if I'm totally honest, to, I won't say accept, but just acknowledge that, you know, this, uh, this brutal, this barbaric, this animalistic environment of 11 players playing against, or 11, you know, 11 boys, 11 girls, you know, whatever gender it is playing against each other, you know, things are, potentially in your hands to make it uneasy for people. Of course, sir. Yeah. I think, I, think, I think it took you a little bit of time to, you know, to not to accept it, but just to play with it. Just mm. to you know, experience it in a way. You got a lot, you know, I said before, you got a lot of experience with the academy kids. Let's talk about the academy kids, because I know a lot, of the, a lot of academy boys, past, present, and future, be listening to this, okay? And again, they all see Jimmy Punter as, as their coach. And because you're quite close to the age group, it's, uh, you know, it's his coach, mentor, manager, friend type of environment. And sometimes that, that, that sort of mentor, coach, manager gets lost in that friendship a little bit. Because, yeah. so, you know, you're only five or six years older than, you know, who, me, you know, Dave's and he's whatever it is, and I'm way above that. So, you know, you get that sort of, the older you get, the little bit of a less friendship you get with a, a younger crowd. Uh, but this is a chance, really. You know, we've seen a lot of players come through. What would you say are some of the attributes that make a good player still play the game at high level now or the attributes that make a good player back then no longer play the game? Because, you know, we, we've seen some players that have gone, like, uh, they started here and it's like they've gone there. And you, you, you don't worry about those. You just go, why? Why? Why, why, why have you done that? You know, what, what are those attributes that some of, the, some of the boys that have done it have, some boys that haven't done it haven't, but also what you're seeing at the moment with the, the academy players? So, again, this, this, this is a brilliant question, Steve, because there's so many different factors that can affect, you know, their development at this age. Um, I, think, I think definitely... The first thing that you know I see, and that that Dave sees, and, and that you've seen as well, is players that have had too much smoke blown up their ass from from a young age, um, and we get you know probably every every two years, maybe one every year even, who someone has said since he was twelve years old, you know, fuck me, this player's unreal. This player's brilliant. And all he's been told is he's brilliant, he's brilliant, he's brilliant. It might have been because at that time he was more technically proficient than everyone else. It might have been at that time that he was, you know, 5'10 and everyone else was 5'2. And it become, when they come into the college system, they, they have to soon realise that they're not better than anyone else. And it's how they deal with that that, that is key. And some of them it takes two weeks, three weeks, two months. Some of them, it takes two years to leave and then go, actually, do you know what? You were right. You were actually right all along. And I think that reaction of being about, A, being open-minded to being coached. So actually taking on information in terms of going, actually, you know what? I don't have to listen to him. I'm this player. I'm that player. Being, 
being coachable is, is is really key. Buying into the things that that we do in terms of strength and conditioning, in terms of nutrition, psychology, um, technical, tactical information, and also buying into the family. Um, and you know, we people think it's corny, but it is. We call it the family because that's really what it is. We spend a lot of time. Uh, the college students spend a lot of time together in the in that building. They make a lot of new friends. They make you know probably a lot of enemies as well. But it's whether they buy into that social element of we're all in this together. Because if they do buy into that, they're more likely to be coachable. And I think that's definitely something that we've seen that players that you know have really kicked on. You know, example, you know Pat Webber who's gone is now at Ipswich. Um, obviously, people like Ricky Aguirre playing for Worthing. You know, when he came into us, you know, he technically, you know, one of the best players I've, I've I've coached at any level. But also, he had the open mindedness to actually go, "No, you're right. I'm going to try this." And you know what? He, you know, he he took that sort of thing on board. Another one of those sort of players was Finton Walsh. You know, obviously, he's playing at Whitehawk. Um, you know, been touted as a very good player as he was younger, came into the college system, was still a good player. But you know, you know, I know he'll be the first one to admit he probably didn't have the best sort of cut starting couple of games for the college. But actually, as that his reaction to that was so good that he then just kicked on and kicked on and kicked on. So definitely that sort of reaction at the start of actually am I open minded enough to be coached is 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 really, really important. Yeah, I, I think this, this, this is a perfect time of a conversation I had uh, recently on a podcast with Aaron Racine. And I, and I asked Aaron, sort of, you know, I very similar question, and it was about, you know, players' development and things like that. And one, so I said, well, you know, one, one, one of the things that you, you see lacking. And he said, people don't want it enough. You know, he said, people love hmm. doing it. They love playing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm powerful, but people love playing the sport, they love playing football, they love kicking the balls around. And, you know, and they're, 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 they're okay, they're technically okay. You know, uh, but he said, people don't want it enough, you know. And he said, you know, when he played, he didn't even want it enough. You know, he did his training, you know, he's in academy systems all his life, professional, played professional sport, you know, professional football, played at Wembley, captain, all that sort of thing. He said, you know, I did my five days a week, it wasn't enough, you know. Yeah. And I, I believe, and this is my opinion, maybe, you know, we can have a conversation, you know, and, and, you know, it's always hindsight when after you've been through that period of time. But I don't think that in general, and it's not everybody, but in general, People don't want it. Players don't want it enough. And what I mean by don't mean enough, I mean, you know, the availability of, let's say, the college scenario, you know, the S&C, you know, you should. And it should be, a, you know, you should be a govern to yourself to not ever miss an S&C session. You should be at every S&C session and you should actually want more S&C sessions. You should be banging on people's doors to say, you know, can you help me with this? And can you help me with that? And can you help me with that? And you should be consumed with it 24 hours a day seven days a week if you're not playing the game to improve you're reading about the game if you're not reading about the game you're watching the game if you're not watching the game you're asking people about the game you're doing this i i don't i personally think that you know in general this is not everybody but in general people don't really want it enough to actually make the changes that they really want to do how do you what's your opinion on that I think that's purely just a reflection on society itself, though, Steve. Yeah, no, yeah, keep going. You know, in, you know, instant gratification is something that is, you know, is is very prominent at the moment. Um, people don't want to have to work hard, but people who do work hard and do work the hardest get somewhere. It's, it's you know, it's it's as simple as that. And I, you know, I found that myself with 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 coaching, with learning to be a coach. Um, I should be doing, for say, your uni work when actually I'm reading a book on coaching. That's because you know I have now I've come out of playing and realised that actually coaching is something that I want to do, and if I want to do it, I'm going to have to put my all into it, which is what now I try to do. I still don't do enough, in fact, but with players. Again, this is where there's no growth in comfort. So a lot of players get comfortable. And it's, actually, it's trying to keep 
the players in that zone between not being too comfortable where they become lazy and not being so uncomfortable that they shut down and don't want to do it. And I think that is, that is where, you know, and something that, you know, I especially love and I know you do as well is, you know, this is where you've got to build relationships. If your relationship is good enough with a player to know how to motivate them and where they're, where they're comfortable in terms of where in the zone they're comfortable and how you can push them to that level where they're stimulated enough where they can actually go and grow, but also they're comfortable enough to not want to, sh- to, to, to leave that environment. That's key. So, yeah, players, players don't do enough off their own back. But if you can then, does that then become the coach's purpose? Is to, is, to, is to facilitate that environment where actually you are stimulating the players to go and do more. And I think that's also half your job. Because if you don't build those relationships, you're not going to get that. You know, especially from, you know, from, from, from teenagers who sometimes... You know, we see it in, in terms of their attitude. We see it, uh, you know, someone coming in at 16 years old, um, doesn't want to do s and um, But by the time they're 18, 19, actually, they've, they've changed their mindset over the year. It might be just because they come in, they're a bit immature when they were 16. Who knows? They've actually realised the benefits of it. And by the time now they're 18, 19, they're actually, you know, very well conditioned. But we can also give that platform to, to those players as soon as they come in by trying to find that zone where we can stimulate them to go and be better. So that doesn't have to wait. And if you can find that, and you're not going to find it with everyone, and there will be some people who just don't want to. And I think at that point, you have to, you have to accept that, okay, you, you don't want it enough. Do I then keep you in the program? Or actually, is that going to negatively affect the mindset of others? And if it negatively affects the mindset of others, done. Done. Absolutely, guys. It, it, you know, when you listen to this again, you know, some of the words that, I, you know, and this is not being disrespectful to you, sir, but, you know, for someone who's so young, 23 years of age, coming up with, coming up with that type of understanding of, of, you know, people buy into people and it's human behavior and it's understanding people will do the best if they are encouraged to be themselves and things like that. What, what Jimmy just said there is way beyond this, you know, this artificial four, four, two, five, three, one, nine, twelve, whatever it's going to be, you know, you play out from here, you're doing that. You know, what Jimmy just said there is a foundation of all human development and all personal interaction is the fact of, you know, it's people believing, wanting and buying into people. It's personality. You've got, you know, we, um, we, Steve, we speak about this all the time in terms of, I know 10% of, or say 25% of the squad, they'll love the gym. So they're going to like S&C. That's part, of their, that's part of their personality. There's also 25% who, who fucking hate the gym. They don't want to go in the gym. They feel anxious about going to the gym. So now we've got to find ways where, where how we can, that's, you know, part of our job is, how can we now get them in the gym? And that's, that's how, that's, you know, where you find these different personalities and actually you make these person you magnify them. You magnify these personalities because actually they have traits that you need in your team somewhere. Here's another question for you. We've, we've both been on uh, we've both been in dugouts together, so to speak. <laughs> uh, and we've had some interesting times and we've had conversations about, uh, how other coaches reacted to situations and things like that. We've, you know, we spoke about it. We've got to laugh about it, but we've also come up with, you know, sort of we have conversations about, are there issues with coaching at the moment? You know, and do you think, what's your opinion on the common state of coaches, man? Now this is not, this is not, everybody we're not saying you know if, if someone comes back negative mm. you listen to it don't say it's, don't take it that it's you you know oh man jimmy said this steve said this it's me no no, no i'm not saying no. That. 
I'm just saying from experiences, we've had guys, we've had, you've been in environments where we've had an amazing chat with the other coaches, shook their hands, it's all kicked off. You know, we've had play sent off, they've had play sent off, and we still shook our hands at the end of the match. So that was a great game. We all love that. And we've had, we've had moments where we've scored in the 89th minute from a corner, and they've flipped their nut, and they've sworn, and they've thrown things, and they've been a tantrum, and you go, wow, well, okay. So we've seen both sides of it. So for those guys who, you know, we're probably, you know, talking about those guys that, you know, when the game finishes and you don't shake the hand and go, that was a great game, mate. You know, look forward to seeing you next month. You know, the other ones that throw their toys out the pram and tantrums to take it personally, etc. They're the ones we tend to sort of speak about because we, we tend not to be like that. We win, lose or draw. You know, as an academy, we, we, we might, we, we walk that fine line, you know, in the old Johnny Cash walk that line type scenario. Mm -hmm. and sometimes we, you know, we, we, we jump over it and sometimes we, you know, rule people in. But at the end of it, when it's all said and done and the dust is settled, we, we, we always shake hands, always give an embrace and, you know, and always acknowledge, you know, a team that's beaten us or players that have done exceptionally well for What, and so for me, uh, that's a bit of a rant, but for me, is that's, that's, that's some of the issues with coaching, you know, too many egos, you know, people believing that they're better than they are and doing, trying to reinvent the veil that it's not, they can't reinvent. What, if there are any, what would, what do you see with your experience of high elite non-league and, and high elite academy are issues with coaching, managing, I'm not sure what you want to call it, as we speak? Well, you know, that, that's definitely going to be my first one, Steve. There's, a, there's, a, there's an air of snobbery in some realms of coaching. Um, not all. But there's also times where, you know, I've personally felt, and, you know, I know from other people that, you know, and I just think, <laughs> you... <laughs> The team, team is a reflection of, of, of the coach's personality. And I think when sometimes these, these, these ego coaches are, are beat, I think then that becomes a personal attack on them as a person. And then there becomes an air of snobbery and this ego where actually they, it's, it, it's not their fault, um, which, you know, you can't have, you can't, you know, you can't have it both ways. Um, so I do think there's an air of snobbery around coaching, but, and this is, you know, and I'll, I'm going to go and say, you know, Twitter, Twitter football, Twitter football is dangerous. I use Twitter all the time and I use it for football stuff all the time. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's a completely a bad thing because I do a lot of research on Twitter. I follow a lot of coaches on Twitter. Um, I follow a lot of organizations who give you training sessions, you know, and all this sort of stuff. But I think that also kills you being creative as a coach. So I think, you know, I'll go on Twitter, I'll find a, I'll, I'll find a, I'll find a session and I think, yeah, that's decent. And then I realise that it doesn't apply anywhere to how I want my team to play. But people will coach it anyway because it's a nice session. And there, this is where Twitter coaching can make you lazy um, in terms of, what are your objectives for your training session and what you're aiming to get out of it. So I think Twitter, social media in general, using the right way is fantastic for, especially for learning, for, for, you know, um, finding new knowledge, um, finding training sessions, you know, listening to, um, podcasts, webinars, something I've been doing a lot recently. It's all brilliant, but then you have to give it context and relate it back to your own practice. Cause if you don't, and I see, you know, I've seen this quite a bit. If you don't relate it back to your own practice and how you do things and how your team sets up and, and the individuals that you have within that system, within that environment, then it, it doesn't work. So I think that's, that's something, you know, in, in coaching that I've seen recently is, you know, so it's negative, but it, it, it hinders uh, an environment where actually you're doing the thinking. Um, and I think probably the last one simplicity is genius we, we don't make I think part of our job as a coach as well is to take the information and knowledge that we have or that we are trying to learn and to get it into its most simplest form to convey to, convey to the players and that's from academy football to, to, to men's football I think sometimes men's football even more so because they don't want to hear jargon they don't want to hear jargon because if you do, if they do hear jargon, they're probably going to think, fuck that. 
or fuck me, he's read a book. So you've got to then make it real. And a lot of players, you know, and this is through me doing it myself. Yeah, so I'm not saying that I'm 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 perfect. I'm saying I've do I done this all the time. In terms of, you know, can I take information? Can I make it as simple as possible so that the players go straight away, yep, I know what you're talking about. Because a lot of these players turn up to training after travelling for an hour and a half, they've been at work all day, they don't really want to listen to, you know, what a half space is. Or, you know, something like that. They just want simple information that they can take on and go, yep, I know that. And I think, again, that's, you know, that's one of the, one that I've, so far is one of the arts that I've found with, with, with coaching. Yeah, no, again, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the common theme, you know, simplicity is best, you know, doing the basics extremely well and wanting to do the basics even better and continue the basics. Uh, and making things that are simple for the individuals you're with and give them that little bit of space to, you know, to develop themselves, the autonomy, you know, that sort of language is coming through on, 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 on regular these podcasts. You know, I like to, mm. you know, for, for me, coaching is one of those things is like, you know, people spend, spend months and months trying to design the best way to sell, you know, sell a product and they go in the real world and no one wants to buy the product, but they still bang the door and, and trying to convince people to buy the product. And actually, rather yeah, hundred percent. What product do you want? You know, if my product's not good enough, what do you want? Because if one person buys the product from me and there's a hundred people outside wants another product, what do you want? You know, because you know you go into the masses, and I think you know we we, we both have the you know the ideology, and we we, like, we do we do we do differ in some of the uh, you know how things are done, but we you know but one one of the common thread that you know is is to make sure that you know everything is done. In 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 in, in, for, in reality, you know, whether mm. you do, it's got to be real, you know. Yeah, hundred percent. I think for me, you know, before I move on, and this is, you know, again, we'll have a conversation about it. But you know, I think that too many things are taken out of the real or the reality of the situation, and people don't quite understand the reality of the situation. So to make sure, or to make your coaching or your managing or your leadership skills as productive as you can, you need to know the reality of the situation to start with, and adapt and change and develop your people to be able to produce in that reality. You know, i.e., if it's pissing down outside and you ain't wearing fucking, you know, you're wearing molds because you like playing in molds, you're gonna fall over. It's not yeah. rocket science, you know, but the environment, the reality of the environment in football is a lot harsher and a lot more animalistic at times, not all the time, but is at times and, and brutal and aggressive and backstabbing and, you know, all those sort of negative connotations. The reality situation is there are many moments in a game of football and throughout the season where that is happening. And unless, oh, unless, unless your team, your players, your, your club, your group, what you want to call them, have the skills to be able to adapt and react to those situations, then you are going to be in, you're going to be in trouble. And that's you know that's why your you, your sessions and your session design has to, has to replicate real situations because that if the reason the how they're going to deal with it is through repetition. You know, and then we say this to our players all the time. If you know, if we don't train with intensity. Will be no in on when it comes to game day, you know you you know I I'd like to think that the intensity of our especially when we do our our training games, the intensity is extremely high, um, which you know sometimes can can lead to some overzealous challenges in training, but what it does do is it prepares us right for game day because we know that when we get to game day we we've experienced that intensity before um and this is you know there's 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 big things in coaching you know unopposed practice versus opposed practice i personally i, I do like unopposed practice for giving pictures but also these opposed practices gives you that real intensity that you need to replicate you know game day situations yeah, I, I, you know, I, I suppose I was going to ask you that question before I move on is, you know, this, this big topic of unimposed versus opposed and, you know, there's, there's elite managers who do unopposed and actually probably if you think about it, more elite managers may do unopposed more now and maybe there may be a, an issue regarding, you know, uh, 
the, the buying of the players, you know, the insurance of the players or what it was going to be. But, you know, I always turn that on just like, you know, it's like, you know, teaching your child to ride a bike. You know, you put the, you know, you put the stabilizers on for a little bit and eventually they've got to come off and you've got to go. And when you go, you're going to fall over. But hey, mm. you can't have the stabilizers all your life. So being unimposed is great, but you've got to put it back into an environment where, you, my, my French, but you're getting kicked to shit. You know, you're getting kicked, you're going for tackles, the intensity is high, you make mistakes, you get elbowed, you get moaned at, you get screamed at. You've got to be in those environments because that happens. And it's also, fo- also, football's not played on a Sabut Air board. You know, football, football in general is, un- is, is un- unpredictable by nature. Um, so, I, you know, I use unopposed practices a lot. I do use unopposed practices, but it's, it, 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 it's, for, it's for giving an idea or giving a solution to, to a moment or a picture of, of how, how the players can, can exploit a weakness. That's, you know, I don't use them as, you know, we have to do this every time we get the ball. But, okay, if you see this, this is a way to exploit that. But, in, you know, once the game starts, really, as a coach, you can't really do anything really too much to affect the game. So, again, the players have got to know when to use it and that's when you can then put it into, an, into a pose practice and going, okay, we've done that pattern. Let's see if we can use it in the right situation. All oh, right, okay, he stepped out, bang, there we go. We've used it in the right situation we've got in. So that's how you can then relate it back into, you know, a real game situation. It's always the reality of the environment. Mm. You, you, make, you do everything you can to mimic the reality that you can and all realities that you face is all chaotic so you give a better, as many tools as you can from you know from being stronger than anybody else being smarter being you know we use this word shithousery being more of a shithouse somebody else being technically better being game management being game savvy game you know uh, knowing your position better etc etc you give as much as you can to go you know in this environment someone's going to come up and you need to have as you know a seven out of ten on all of them, rather than having an eight out of ten, a nine out of ten, and a three out of ten here, because yeah. probably that eight out of nine and ten will make you look good if that three is applicable. But you, you, because you're only three out of ten, you can't even do that eight or nine. Yeah, I'm gonna finish off with some quick five questions, mate. Uh, these are gonna be really you've done nothing about these. You did, actually none of the questions <laughs> you know about anyway. But okay. you, have, you have, and this is this is right, guys. If you're listening to this, guys, and, and you are an academy player, past, present, future, please don't take this personally. Okay, he loves all of you. Trust me. You know, oh, I do. No bad word for any of you, but you know, when someone gets put on the spot and it's a quick fire sort of set of questions, they may they say something, they may after and go, "Oh, my gosh, <laughs> or you know, whatever." All right. So, in your experiences, okay, quick fire, as quick as we can. Who's the best academy player that you've seen? Ricky Gua. Who has the most potential as an academy player that is currently in the system? Callum Jenkins. If you uh, if you could take four academy players, past or present, uh, hey, no, rephrase that, rephrase that. What are the top five academy players? If you had a father side team, would be in it more. Me and Goal, obviously. Good shot. <laughs> uh, that is difficult. Greg Gander at centre half. Harvey Sparks. Ricky Aguirre. Charlie Dennis. That's your five. And, yeah. I'm, I'm, and currently, you know, we're, we're, we're in lockdown and, and uh, you know, and, and some, uh, some of the Caddy boys, past, present, and future, as well as, you know, the guys who work at Horsham, you know, uh, maybe finding this time difficult, okay? You know, started off quite well. They did their exercising, they did their reading, they did the school, they did education work, what's going to be. And, and, but I think it, we've all realised that, you know, everything is starting to be harder, okay? So, and once listen to this, what is your advice to keep everything going motivationally as we speak when some people are finding it hard to basically get up in the morning and carry out an active active day. You know, we spoke a lot to the academy boys about routine. 
keeping in a routine. And I, you know, I, I think with the distractions around and then being teenagers, I think routine is very, very difficult. Um, and I also think that we shouldn't be too harsh on it. Teenagers are going to sleep in, okay, if, if given the opportunity. Over a period of two, two and a half months, if they have to stay in every day for two and a half months, no matter how much I bang on about routine, two na- teenagers are going to sleep in, I think, personally. So we have to kind of, to, an, to a point, accept that. It's now, can we get routine instructions the rest of the day, including exercise? And exercise has been, you know, something that's really even more important now. Um, you know, Steve, you know me. I've even been going out running most days. Okay. Miracle, I know. Miracle, I'm still alive. That, on the days that I wake up and I feel not, don't feel motivated to do anything, when I, when I sleep in, I have to go and run now because it makes me feel better and it makes me, you know, bright eyed and want and, and I can get on with work. So that's definitely something that I feel, you know, and I remember Nath, and if you guys don't follow SPC, please go and follow SPC because they're a real great organization. Nath always says to me from SPC, he says, if you're tired and you go out and you don't want to go out on a run, what's it gonna make you more tired? So it doesn't matter. You're either tired or you come back tired, but you've still run and you've still got exercise. And actually it makes you feel better. Yeah. It makes me feel a lot better. So anyone, Academy boys, anyone listening in quarantine, you know, do make sure that maybe you might do half an hour of work. You get up, walk around the house, you go outside, get some vitamin D if the sun's out, come back in half an hour of work, get up, go outside, go for a run, might take you half an hour, come back, then you might be able to do an hour hour work. Obviously, you eat, shower, whatever. But that's taking up three, four hours of your day. That's three or four hours well spent of a, of, of a day when you're awake for, say, I don't know, you know, 14 hours, 15 hours. So if you can get into that sort of routine, you know, you're, you're, you're halfway on to you know, getting work done in time, you know, doing things that you want to do. And you never know. You might realise that you've got more time than you thought and you might be able to learn, learn something new. Perfect. And one more question for those guys that are uh, probably not so much the, 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 part, uh, the, the, uh, the past, but more to the guys that are staying in the carry this year uh, or this academic year that's come up in September. New guys that are coming in and the guys yeah. that, you, uh, that, you, that, you, that you work with at Horsham. What is your last bit of advice? To these guys. <laughs> so this, 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 is, this is Jimmy Punter's life advice. All right? All said and done, mate. You're sitting there on, the, on, you know, on your pedestal waiting to go somewhere. And, you know, and, you know the ten eyes come out and it's bang. Your, you know, your, your words of wisdom. What is it? Be honest with yourself. Love it. Be honest with yourself in terms of what's your personality. And how can you magnify that? Also, be honest with yourself of where you are in your progress and how you can improve yourself. I think a lot of people aren't honest with themselves and then they become too comfortable and they don't grow. So, yeah, be honesty with yourself and honesty with others. Guys, when you listen to this back, for someone who's 23, not only has he got a wealth of experience, but as you've heard, you know, he has, he has insight beyond these beyond these years jimmy punter thank you so much for thank you Stephen. on this podcast mate thank you for having me hey mate it, it should have been done a long time ago uh as i said previously jimmy's a student of mine but because we are no longer in face-to-face contact because of the, the situation the world's in come september when i go back and teach again he's no longer my student okay no so go on to bigger and much better things <laughs> smile there somewhere uh, and he will he will finish his degree and go and do a master's and he get a PhD one day in the whole the whole shebang so remember what I said to you before the start of this show is listen to this 
ask Jimmy questions, speak to him, get in contact with him because he is a person that in the next five or 10 years will be working in the elite football somewhere. And, you know, you can turn on and go, yeah, I spoke to that guy once and he's a friend of mine. And, and, and that's, as we know, as we always say that, you know, this, this, this is not really about how good you are in your sport or how clever you are. It's about, you know, personal relationships and, and, and people, people loving people. And that's, that's, that's what this is all about, you know, having a reputation and leaving something behind that is far bigger than what, what your skill was as a, as a football player. And that's a big reason why the success of the college and Jimmy gets it because it's working with that person and, and growing relationships and being bigger than the actual the, the sport or the environment is. So, Jimmy, once again, mate, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Guys, check this out. Keep checking out uh, podcasts, Music with the Moomer Man. As always, I always leave this. Stay safe, stay at home, but more importantly, have as much fun as you can. Until next time, guys. See you soon. Bye-bye. Cheers, mate.